All silencing of discussion is an assumption of infallibility. We hear about freedom of speech a lot these days. In almost all Western democracies, freedom of speech is supposedly a cherished and valued right among the population. But do we all interpret it the same way? Is freedom of speech actually valued and protected by everyone? Have we all taken a moment to actually think through why we have freedom of speech in the first place? We will examine these topics and more through John Stuart Mill's famous essay on liberty. The essay consists of five chapters as follows. Introductory, of the liberty of thought and discussion, on individuality as one of the elements of well-being, of the limits to the authority of society over the individual, and applications. For the sake of time, we will focus on the first three chapters. Introductory. In this very first chapter, John Stuart Mill specifically states that the subject of the essay is social liberty and how much authority the society can exercise over the individual. He then explains that social liberty has always struggled in the face of authorities. The struggle between liberty and authority is the most conspicuous feature in the portions of history with which we are earliest familiar particularly in that of Greece, Rome, and England. But in old times, this contest was between subjects, or some classes of subjects, and the government. A large portion of human history consisted of the struggle between a single ruler versus the masses, or a privileged few at the top of the social hierarchy against the rest of the population. But as democratic governments started to become the standard in the West, a new form of authoritarian threat emerged. Tyranny of the majority. John Stuart Mill writes, The tyranny of the majority is now generally included among the evils against which society requires to be on its guard. The tyranny of the majority is basically when a society pressures individuals into conforming to certain behaviors and attitudes toward life. The masses essentially decide what is and is not acceptable. Regarding this new form of tyranny, John Stuart Mill states, Society can and does execute its own mandates, and if it issues wrong mandates instead of right, or any mandates at all in things with which it ought not to meddle. It practices a social tyranny more formidable than many kinds of political oppression, since, though not usually upheld by such extreme penalties, it leaves fewer means of escape, penetrating much more deeply into the details of life, and enslaving the soul itself. So with this new form of tyranny in mind, Mill lays out the characteristics of a free society by identifying three types of liberties citizens should be entitled to. It comprises, first, the inward domain of consciousness, demanding liberty of conscience in the most comprehensive sense, liberty of thought and feeling, absolute freedom of opinion and sentiment on all subjects, practical or speculative, scientific, moral, or theological. Secondly, the principle requires liberty of tastes and pursuits, of framing the plan of our life to suit our own character, of doing as we like, subject to such consequences as may follow, without impediment from our fellow creatures, so long as what we do does not harm them even though they should think our conduct foolish, perverse, or wrong. 
thirdly, from this liberty of each individual follows the liberty within the same limits of combination among individuals, freedom to unite for any purpose not involving harm to others. The persons combining being supposed to be of full age and not forced or deceived. So to summarize, the following are the three types of liberties required in a free society. One, liberty of thought and feeling. Two, liberty of tastes and pursuit. And three, liberty to unite. Mill makes it very clear in the essay that as long as we are not causing harm to others, we should all be free to think and feel whatever we want, that we should be free to pursue a lifestyle we see as optimal for us, and that we should be able to get together as a group to move towards a common goal or interest. Mill believes that we should be able to do all of these things regardless of what others might think as long as we are not harming others. And even if we live in a so-called democracy, Mill believed that if we were not granted these liberties, we are not living in a free society. No society in which these liberties are not, on the whole, respected, is free. Whatever may be its form of government, and none is completely free in which they do not exist absolute and unqualified. Mill admitted that these are not new concepts and may seem rather redundant to us. However, he felt the need to write a thorough essay on this subject because while it seemed that everyone was on board with all these ideas on paper, in reality, many people were not practicing them. He felt that our right to expressing different thoughts and feelings was in danger. And that brings us to the second chapter. Of the Liberty of Thought and Discussion In an imperfect state of the human mind, the interests of truth require a diversity of opinions. By now, it's obvious that John Stuart Mill was a huge advocate for freedom of speech and freedom of expression. In this chapter, he lays out four reasons why freedom of speech needs to be valued and protected in society. First, if we deny others the opportunity to express their opinions and perspectives, we are assuming that we are always right. And if history taught us anything, it is that humans are capable of believing some absurd ideas. There is definitely a possibility that what we thought was false turns out to be the truth. Mill points to the case of Socrates and that we must not forget how he was unjustly put to death by his fellow countrymen. First, if any opinion is compelled to silence, that opinion may, for aught we can certainly know, be true. To deny this is to assume our own infallibility. Next, Mill points out that while our opinion and thoughts might be correct, it's rarely the whole truth. Our thoughts and conclusions are usually very incomplete ideas. So while our ideas might be based on solid ground, other opinions might contain a piece of truth. We must encourage open discussions to get all the fragments of truth from everyone. Secondly, though the silenced opinion be an error, it may, and very commonly does, contain a portion of truth. And since the general or prevailing opinion on any object is rarely or never the whole truth, it is only by the collision of adverse opinions that the remainder of the truth has any chance of being supplied. The third reason why freedom of speech needs to be actively promoted is that otherwise even truths can lose their value and meaning. While certain beliefs might be completely true, 
perhaps backed up by science and evidence. If they are not regularly challenged, they can turn into prejudice or bias. If we look around society, it's not too hard to find instances where a certain idea is believed by a large number of people, but when asked why they believe in those ideas, almost no one can give solid explanations. They just accepted those ideas as truths only because everyone around them did the same, and no one ever questioned them. Thirdly, even if the received opinion be not only true, but the whole truth, unless it is suffered to be, and actually is, vigorously and earnestly contested, it will, by most of those who receive it, be held in the manner of a prejudice, with little comprehension or feeling of its rational grounds. Similar to this, the fourth reason Mill gives is that a set of beliefs, including tradition and customs, can lose their meaning and power, which in turn can destroy an individual's confidence in their own values and even the purpose of their lives can be lost. Just like in the third reason Mill pointed out, if beliefs are not questioned at all, they can lose their validity no matter how true they are. While that may not be a big deal in some instances, in other situations, that type of uncertainty could wreck an individual's life purpose. And not only this, but fourthly, the meaning of the doctrine itself will be in danger of being lost or enfeebled and deprived of its vital effect on the character and conduct. The dogma becoming a mere formal profession, and efficacious for good, but cumbering the ground, and preventing the growth of any real and heartfelt conviction from reason or personal experience. Beliefs and ideas greatly affect our personalities, behavior, and mindset. No matter what the beliefs are, they all guide us in our personal growth one way or another. But if those beliefs and ideas were to lose their ground, it might lead us to be uncertain of our own identity and feel lost in life. Regarding unquestioned beliefs, Mill states, however unwilling a person who has a strong opinion may admit the possibility that his opinion may be false, he ought to be moved by the consideration that however true it may be, if it is not fully, frequently, and fearlessly discussed, it will be held as a dead dogma, not a living truth. Finally, perhaps Mill's most powerful line in the entire chapter is very applicable to our society today. The worst offense of this kind which can be committed by a polemic, is to stigmatize those who hold a contrary opinion as bad and immoral men. We see this type of behavior all too often today, especially on social media. Anyone who doesn't agree with a certain doctrine isn't viewed as just a unique individual. They are deemed immoral. Mill would be shaking his head if he saw what people posted on social media these days. And now, on to the next chapter. Of individuality as one of the elements of well-being. To give any fair play to the nature of each, it is essential that different persons should be allowed to lead different lives. Through the acceptance of freedom of speech, thought, and discussion, a free society should also allow people to be individuals, and Mill strongly believed that would benefit society as a whole. Let's take a look at how that might be true. Mill feared a future in which we live our lives solely based upon tradition and custom. He was afraid of this because when we go about our days and weeks based on tradition, custom, and habits alone, we are not actively thinking about our day-to-day -day lives. We are not making conscious decisions 
on how to live. We are not living life deliberately. We have to make deliberate choices in life on a regular basis in order to figure out what we want and how to best obtain it. So as long as it doesn't harm others or have dire consequences, it doesn't matter if our day-to-day -day decisions turn out to be wrong or not optimal. What matters is that we are exercising our decision-making skills. He who does anything because it is the custom makes no choice. He gains no practice either in discerning or in desiring what is best. The mental and moral, like the muscular powers, are improved only by being used. We need to take the time to think about what our purpose in life is and what's the best way for us to live. While others may have different ways of living, our lifestyle has to suit our needs. And even if it turns out to be unconventional, as long as we come up with the answers on our own, then that is the best option for us at the time. Mill is telling us that we cannot let others choose our life path for us. We must choose for ourselves. He who lets the world, or his own portion of it, choose his plan of life for him, has no need of any other faculty than the ape-like one of imitation. He who chooses his plan for himself employs all his faculties. He must use observation to see, reasoning and judgment to foresee, activity to gather materials for decision, discrimination to decide, and when he has decided, firmness and self-control to hold to his deliberate decision. So now we have seen Mill's views on how freedom of thought, expression, and discussion can encourage proper individuality and foster some level of well-being. Let's see what he has to say about the effect of individuality on society as a whole. It is not by wearing down into uniformity all that is individual in themselves, but by cultivating it and calling it forth within the limits imposed by the rights and interests of others that human beings become a noble and beautiful object of contemplation. And as the works partake the character of those who do them, by the same process, human life also becomes rich, diversified, and animating, furnishing more abundant element to high thoughts and elevating feelings, and strengthening the tie which binds every individual to the race, by making the race infinitely better worth belonging to. In proportion to the development of his individuality, each person becomes more valuable to himself and is therefore capable of being more valuable to others. Having said that individuality is the same thing with development and that it is only the cultivation of individuality which produces or can produce well-developed human beings, I might here close the argument for what more or better can be said of any condition of human affairs than that it brings human beings themselves nearer to the best thing they can be? Or what worse can be said of any obstruction to good than that it prevents this? Through these words, it's very clear that Mill wholeheartedly believed that allowing individuals to be themselves gives them the best shot at becoming the finest version of themselves, and as a result, a more valuable member of society. Allowing people to choose their own paths, that is the answer for a thriving society according to Mill. In order for that to happen, we must not silence anyone. We must all do our part 
in encouraging free discussions and listen to others' opinions, no matter how uncomfortable it might be. I would like to wrap up the video with a beautiful quote regarding human development. Human nature is not a machine to be built after a model and set to do exactly the work prescribed for it, but a tree which requires to grow and develop itself on all sides according to the tendency of the inward forces which make it a living thing. Thank you for watching.